fellow travelers and welcome to another episode of traversing the stars podcast this is a third season how are you my loyal listeners thank you for your continued support this is an amazing episode because jeff haas of traversing the stars is the guest and i am the guest host my name is barney smith of storycomic.com and now come aboard as we go traversing the stars it's weird being on the other side of that, I will just say. <laughs> well, it's so great because, you know, it's, it's it's amazing because you truly are a star, Jeff, of uh, of this. And, 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 and we're here to celebrate three seasons of the Traversing the Star podcast. Yes, so, three long. Congratulations. Seasons. Thank you. And so, so talk to us a little bit because I, I was honored enough to be the, the guest host for your second anniversary. Oh, yes. Right. See. And so talk to us a little bit about how this last year has been for you. Um, I think like any podcast, it's been up and down. Um, I'm at uh, 985 subscribers. So I'm 15 away from the magic number. So I'm kind of excited about that. I'm hoping to get that number uh, tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, more uh, realistically, probably not till the end of November. Uh, we've had some great guests. Um David Hewlett's been back a few times. John Billingsley's been back. Um, Peggy Lou had back in the show. Dan Jurgens for the first time at, um, on the show. He's he's been on a bunch of really cool guests. Um, Karen Gillen and you know, and like I'm kind of you know, at times I feel like I'm blowing up and everything's going fantastic. Sometimes there's been low moments where I'm like, no one's ever listened to my show ever again, and everything in between. I um, though I will say this: for the first time I think ever doing my podcast. I'm cool with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I used to like freak out. Like, every time I would, I'd, I'd get a, I'd do an interview and the numbers weren't good for one for a show, I'd be like, they hate me. They realize I'm a fraud. They don't ever want to watch my show ever again. And then um, there'd be times when a show blows up, like Gabriel Ruiz's show blew up. I was like, I'm going to be massive. I'm a superstar. This is going to go so well. And then it's like that ride, like that seesaw thing that I, that I, that I, I was riding. And now I'm just kind of like, whatever. But, like, it goes well. Fantastic. When it doesn't go well, fuck it. It's fine. <laughs> and and I'm kind of like I'm not like I found like this like calm. It's like it's not a complete calm, but like a more than usual calm where I'm just like, right. that's all right. You know, this is is you know just write it out, just write it out. And um, I think that is the best growth I've had for the third season. Right. And so, yeah. And so what, what are some of these other things that you've learned about yourself over this past year as well? Um, my stutter does not go away when I do intros and outros. Uh, <laughs> I do them both way more times than I should. Um, I realized that um, my eyes do not like being in front of the light for this length of time for any one interview. <laughs> so they uh, flicker and get like uh, strained out. But for, I, for, for the most part, I think I realized I'm getting better at being able to talk about any subject as if I'm more knowledgeable on the subject than I truly am. Uh, and, and I've been able to be better at living. Um, I think when I first started doing this, I was very beholden to my questions. And if I didn't get, if I missed the question, I made sure I hit the question, you know, I'd be like, well, let's go back to blah, blah, blah question. Make sure I talk about that one. Now I'm kind of more like, all right, we're not talking about that then move on, you know, move on, adapt, keep talking about, you know, and, and I think I'm getting more confident at being able to ad lib my interviews more than I used to be. Right now, uh, so talk to us a little bit also about some of the some of the technology that you've been able to uh, adapt to as well over this past year. Um, for interviews themselves, not as, as much adapting as I would. I did have a new uh, my new desktop computer, so that's kind of fancy. So it's the big screen. So I kind of feel like like uh, Bruce Wayne in the Batcave with the big screen in front of me that I get to do my interviews in front of. Uh, it has this little crap-ass camera that also has my speaker, but it's fine. I, I had to inv invest in that uh, micro um, microphone that you have. That looks really fucking impressive. So my next goal is actually to uh, buy that. That's my next goal. So you are apparently my, my, my future goal. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's just like it's a Yeti. I've had this for a few years and it's and it's done pretty well for itself. So yeah. Yeah. It's it not looks bad. professional. I yeah. mine doesn't look that professional. I just look like some jackass on the screen when someone comes on. I'm just like, hey, you have like this like microphone that says like I do interviews. You know? <laughs> so 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 yeah, you you are now my uh, future goal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so, but also too, you've kind of pivoted a bit too from you know some of your 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 early your early inspirations was just focusing a lot on like science fiction, yeah, guests and stuff like that. So talk to us a little bit about how you've evolved your 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 mission of traversing the stars. Um, I mean, the the, the basic goal of traversing the stars is to interview as many interesting people as humanly possible. Um, you know, I did a lot of earlier with Star Trek. Um, I went to that well frequently because it's an easy well to drink out of because the views just kind of like spill out of it. Um, but at the same time, you find you just are hitting the same audience over and over and over, which is great. I, I do I do love the Star Trek audience, but it's time to you know I want to talk about other things as well. Uh, I've talked to um athletes. I've, I've spoken to um, like I just recently interviewed one of the actors from the TV show Found, which is a you know NBC drama. And I'm doing a lot of with composers as well. Um, and I and I find that talking about music is sort of like talking about any writing. You know, it's a creative process. It's telling a story musically instead of in words. And um, I'm enjoying it. And it gives me access to uh, films that were, you know, you want to get to because I couldn't get the actors on. Um, King of the Planet of the Apes, uh, J- um, John Pisano. You know, it's, I got the music sent to me like two weeks before anyone else saw that music and that's a pretty cool feeling you know i'm sitting you know driving to um, work and i have you know john pisano's music playing in my ear and i know i'm one of the few people who got to hear it and yeah it's it's a little pat on my back you know it's like hey look at me you know i'm somewhat interesting for a couple of days you know so no it's been fun and traversing stars has to grow and i wanted to grow bigger and i'm gonna you know like i'd love to have uh, some politicians on the show as well one of these days so and argue um you know, and debate them on um, issues and stuff like that. That'd be fun too at some point, but that's a little hard to do. Um, But at the same time, hey, if anyone from Star Trek wants to come on my show, Michael Dorn, if you're listening, you know, you have a a spot open and I'm I'm ready to uh, geek out on some Star Trek. And, you know, if Mark Hamill ever wants to come on my show, let's geek out some Star Wars. Uh, But I'm pretty sure they're not listening and that was for no reason. (laughs) (laughs) So, so how how does that process work? Do, or because you've been doing it for so long, do you actually have people that reach out to you and want to be a guest? Um, still, I, yeah, I do. I do, um, I do have a lot of people um, reaching out to me, going, "Hey, would you like to interview so and so?" Sometimes I say yes, and sometimes I get to say no. Now I'm I'm now established well enough now that I do now ignore some requests, which is kind of cool because like I, I was kind of like a bit of a hoe. Yeah, you know, like early on, I was just like, anyone who wanted to come on my show, I was like, sure, come on in. I don't care who you are. I'll take you. Now I'm just like, nah. Like, like what's his IDB, IDMB rating? No, I don't I don't go that low. I'm not, I'm not going to deal with that. And <laughs> You know what I mean? Uh, I, it's actually established well enough that I feel I can be more selective of who my guest is. Um, I can start thinking in terms of, do, am I really interested in who this person is? Or am I trying, you know, just trying to like kiss up to a publicist? And I'm at the point now where I do sometimes get to turn down um, requests. You know, be like, no, that actor isn't, you know, up to my standard of what I want on my show, that kind of thing. And I'm going to say, this is a nice little ego boost. Sometimes I'll be like, no, you know, but at the same time, you got to be a little careful. Because what I do find too is that more often than not, the biggest interviews I've ever had view- for view counts have been. For the guests that I never thought anything of, huh. like I'm telling you, I thought like this is you know I mean I, I mean don't get me wrong I like the guest, but I thought to myself no one's ever gonna you know this view count is gonna be awful this is not that kind of guest you know who bring a big view count, and they're like the biggest ones I've ever had quite often, and I found so there's a risk that a lot of some of the people I'm saying no to would actually be the biggest interviews I've ever had, and I'm costing myself by not taking those interviews, but at the same time. I got to make sure it's an interview I want to take now, you know, because I go to work, I go to school, I do a part-time job with my publicist gig. I do my comic book stuff. I don't have so much time in my day that I can 
I want to spend it with people who I'm not interested in. Mm. Now, so, so my next question for you then is, is where, where do you see traversing the stars in the next three years then? Next three years? Yeah. Cause this is your 30th anniversary. So what's oh, indeed. Like so we're doubling years. this time period. Um, you know, I'm sitting down with um, Jason Momoa, um, you know, arguing about his uh, fifth or sixth Aquaman movie. I don't know. Uh, you know, obviously I'm going to be... <laughs> no, I mean, the, the odds are um, the growth will be slow and incremental, uh, as these things tend to be. Um, I would like to think that um, what I'm finally starting to see a lot now um, on my show, which is huge, is that I'm beginning to get fans. People mm -hmm. who repeatedly watch every episode I do. And that to me is cooler than the view count. You know, because you know, because sometimes you get a good view count, you're like, hey, pat myself on the back, I'm famous. But the repeat viewers who continuously respond in comments to my show is cooler. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because those people are the ones that I know watch the episode because they like the show, not because they recognize the name in the interview. Mm. So I want more of those people. And if the view counts were lower and those fans are higher, you know, the number of fans who are just fans of the show, I think it's a good place to be, you know? And those people, I think all the time on my um, comment section, you know, I always thank them, you know, Hey, thank you for responding. Thank you for the comment. And honestly, that's genuine as all hell. It's cool to, as, with like, I have no idea seeing the same names pop up in comments on different shows. It's cool, and I owe them, and that's actually the biggest ego boost that I have. Oh, so, how, could you you mention that? How do you balance your your day? How many how many interviews do you usually record in in a in a week? Um, usually, um, I've I've, I've pared down because of uh, work and school. I probably still do about three interviews a week. Um, I do, but at the same time, like this week, I, for um, just, just so happens this week, I actually didn't have any interviews this week. I'm just going to play out that way. But um, the week before I had four. Hmm. So it kind of, so I mean, I actually do have a backlog. So that's why I, I kind of eased off a little bit because the backlog is like, I'm posting interviews from interviews in August. So you don't want to do that because the stuff becomes less and less valuable the longer it takes between the, what you're trying to sell for them and when the show actually airs. So I try to keep it about three interviews a week, um, every week. And uh, yeah, so probably in every given, um, in each year, I probably have conducted 140, 150, 160 interviews in, in a year. Mm. And, and and so, what, as you mentioned, some of the people that come back, and you, how, how do you credit that with your because of your interview skills? Is that's always a good sign when people want to come back on your show. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the things that they've said? The reason why they they want to come back? A lot of free time. Um, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes like David Hewlett has been on the show multiple times. He's been on the show, I think three or four times now and we just connect well i mean he's a kind of a geek i'm a geek and i find that with him on the show we just kind of go talk for like two hours we don't really you know for just we just like um bullshit for like two hours that's fantastic um some of them are just um i think they just they enjoyed the show and i think they appreciate that the questions aren't crap you know i'm not you know i watch a lot of these shows as well not as much as i probably should but i watch a lot of the shows and you know, and and there's a lot of them are like the pre um box questions. Um, uh, a lot of them, you know, like what do you like about acting? Uh, what do you like about the show that you did? How fun was it to do the show that you did? It was like, all right, guy, okay, you, you should watch the fucking show, you know, and then ask some real questions. And I like to think that more often than not, my interviews seem like I understand what they do. I studied what they do, and the questions took some time to put together and ask, you know, um, you know, like some of these people, like you listen, you're just like, did they just like wing it? You know, that's what it sounds like. Or, you know, but some people you listen to, um, this uh, a couple of great interview uh, shows that I watched as well. This, this guy who interviewed me, like uh, facts was fantastic. I, your show's fantastic. Kurt Sasso, he does a great job. When you listen to, the, to your shows, it sounds like you actually kind of like know what you're talking about and you like paid attention to who your guest actually is. And if that guest was someone different, the questions would be different. 
And I think that matters to these people. And I think they know, I think they appreciate it. And that's why they come back. They go, Hey, this guy does a genuine thing. He pays attention. He cares. He's a fan. Even if you're not necessarily necessarily, you may not be a fan, but at least you come off like a fan. And I think that's why they, uh, people come back and it's a good feeling. You, you know, pat yourself on the back. And you're like, Hey, it's always nice when they come back to the show, you know, it's like, Oh, I didn't blow it. The last, you know, I didn't blow it. Like I thought I did. They're back here. They are, you know, or they totally forgot who I am. And I got them again. Yes, I don't know how it works. That's probably one of the two. Is it, it, how it plays out. And and, and so, what, what's your? I, and also, as, as a fellow podcaster, what do you use for like editing software? What do you use to edit with? Use a uh, Wondershare Filmora. Okay, it, it's a pretty good um, system. It, it's it's probably not one of the best editing softwares out there. I'm just guessing, but it's idiot proof. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like. I don't understand technology very well. Um, there's really n- no real reason I should be able to do a podcast because I'm virtually, I you know my tech knowledge is very limited. But Windows Share Filmora is very simple to use. It took me um, not too long to under- to learn it. It doesn't take very long, you know, even when you screw around with it. It, it's still within the a framework of um, easy, easily to understand uh, how to undo what you did and stuff like that. It, it's good. And if one of share from members listen to this, they now owe me um, and some advertising fee and they should uh, give me a couple months off of what I pay. And, uh, you know, that'd be helpful. But uh, still, I would say um, one of share from Mirror is, is idiot proof, which is why I like it. Um, if, if it was that the same program you've been using the whole time then? Um, yes, because, um, I'm too illiterate to figure out a better program. So I just keep the same, I, I'm very much like into routine. If, if, if you ever want to know how do I balance, cause I think you asked me, how do I balance school work, part-time work, being a husband and doing my podcast and do my comic book stuff and everything else, routine, routine, routine. So using the same freaking equipment every day for three years helps because it's just at least the routine I don't stress about. I understand it. I have it. And I just keep using it over and over and over again because the routine of that is simple enough. Just like Zoom. I use Zoom all the time. Just have Google Meets and all the other crap. So I understand Zoom. It's my routine. And I, as long as I keep to my routine, everything's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and so, because uh, remember, we were on a show last time and like we were talking about who your, like your um, dream guest is. Yes. No, because your dream guest is Neil Gaiman, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That 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 was the thing. That was the thing. Uh, past tense, important to um, highlight. Past tense. Uh, do you, you know? Do you know what's going on with Neil Gaiman? No. All right. I'm gonna preface this part of the interview by saying the word allegedly, 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 allegedly. Okay. Neil Gaiman has fled from social media. Apparently, he's connected with some form of sexual harassment of women. I think there's been three or four that have now claimed that he somehow, some form of sexual indecency with them. Um, And he has fled social media because of that. Uh, Good Omens TV show has virtually been canceled um, because they've only come with one movie after what they just had because of it. And right now he's persona non grata in the world of uh, comic books and social media. Um, due to um, those incidents that may or may not be true because it's alleged. But unfortunately, when you say he's the one who was always my dream interview, I can't. Even if he were to say, I mean, actually, if he asked me, I don't know. I mean, if he asked me to kind of be on your show, um, <clears throat> there would be a different part of my brain that still says yes. But the reality is it would have to be no. Well, then who's who's now your new dream interview then? Oh, in the world of, com- in the world of comic books, my dream interview... God, that's that's that really the hard one. I would I would love to have um there's a few of them. Mike Magnola, I would love to have from Hellboy. That'd be a hell of an interview. Um, I'd love to have Todd McFarlane on the show from Spawn. Um I would love to get um let's say uh Jeff Johns, get him on the show and talk Green Lantern from back in the day when he was on Green Lantern. Those are probably the three big ones for uh celebrities. There's so many celebrities I'd love to have. I mean, for Star Trek, I mean. George Decay, holy shit! Getting George, if I could get George Decay, uh, Sulu on this show, I'd lose my fucking mind. I, 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 I would virtually just spend my entire time just stuttering, um, 
and I probably wouldn't ask him any questions. I'd just be like, uh, keep talking. And that's probably my entire interview process with him. Um, I would love to have um, Jonathan Frakes. I was this close to Jonathan Frakes on an interview, this fucking close to getting him on my show. And it, and it fell through, but I was like, mm, mother, you know, uh, Michael Dorn, I would love to have on the show uh, from Star Trek Next Generation. Uh, Mark Hamill would be a effing amazing. Um, I don't know. There, there, there's, there's, there's a lot. Um, there, there's a bigger list of those who I wish were on my show than so far I've had all my show so far. So there's, there's, there's got to keep pushing my show so one day I can get these guys on, you know, on the program. So out of out of the out of the Star Trek shows, which which Star Trek show have you had the most guests from? Is it Deep Space Nine? Is it Next Generation? Is it Voyager? Um, I got to do some math, some some numbers in my head. Technically, it's probably um, the newer shows, like Strange New World. I've probably had the most on. Um, maybe Discovery, Star Trek Discovery. But if you go to the original programs, the original programs. Um, let's see. I've had just Will Whedon from Next Generation, from um, Deep Space Nine. I had Armin Shimmerman on the show. Um, I think I had. Uh, a couple other guests that they had. Oh, um, JG Hersler, who was a, a a guest, a recurring guest, a few recurring guests. Voyager, I had Tim Russ on the show, and I had Robert Picardo on the show. So that one's probably pretty close. And I had Martha Hackett, who was a recurring character on that show as well. Um, and Enterprise, I just had Billingsley. So it's probably the newer shows, either Strange New Worlds or Star Trek Discovery. And I've had maybe four or five from each program. And I will say, I will talk to Star Trek all freaking day. What, so anybody from Deep Space Nine then? Oh, Deep Space Nine. Um, Armin Shimmerman um, was on the show. Uh, he's Quark. He played Quark from Deep Space Nine. And he's one of my favorite interviews I've ever had. I had him on twice. Um, he is the, one of the most fascinating individuals I've ever spoken to in my entire life. He's like uh, one of the most foremost authorities on Shakespeare. Um, as an English teacher, that's a huge thing. Um, he is writer. He's, as a writer, he is phenomenal. He wrote a book... Um, um something Alaria, I can't remember what it was called. Um something Alaria. Uh based on a, a a Shakespeare um 13th, I think 13th night, I think it was. God, my brain's yeah. is getting old. Anyways, and it's just he's a fascinating guy. If if I had to rank my two favorite guests of all time, David Hewlett, Armin Shimmerman, my two favorite guests of all time. Really? Yeah. Okay. Are you still actively looking? Because I'm I'm just really getting into um during covid i started watching uh i watched the entire next generation series i never watched it before mm. loved it and then naturally from the next generation you're supposed to watch deep space nine so i've been yep. watching deep space i think i'm on season five now of deep space nine and it's better and better it gets better and better i know because now we're like full on into like dominion territory now yep. and you're seeing a lot more you know back and forth of just like really substantial character development happening with all the characters. Um, and then after that, you get, you get supposed to watch Voyager, right? right? After. Yeah. But you can start watching them in tandem a little bit, maybe. Or... Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Voyager and Deep Space Nine don't really inter um, overlap anymore with um, storyline. So you can kind of watch them in, in those, um, any direction you want at that point. Um, but yeah, Voyager, I must say the first season of Voyager, actually the first two, I tried watching Voyager multiple times, and I and I'm, I will say, I first two seasons I just couldn't get into it. I tried and I failed. I tried and failed. Tried and failed. And then eventually, I started interviewing some of the actors from Voyager, so I had to sit and watch the shows like completely. It gets good. It gets really freaking good. And Voyager, um, my wife loves it. Um, I got really highly into it. I got to meet Kate McGrew at a, um, I think it was Boston Comic Con, and she was phenomenal to meet. Um, I will say. The older I get, the more of a Star Trek fan I become. Right. And it, it it's smarter than I remember being a, as a kid. You appreciate it more uh, for what it is. You, you, I, it has, when I was a kid, Star Wars was the thing. You right. know, shoot, shooting things at each other, laser swords, it's wonderful. As an adult, Star Trek has overcome, uh, overtaken Star Wars as my ideal sci-fi. Right. Same thing for me, too, because there's like there's an audacity of optimism that yeah. exists in like for that for the future. It's just like this is how the future is going to be. We're all going to live together. We're all going to have a fun time. You know, it's like yeah. it's just there's something about 
like yeah there's something about like you know like embracing the idea of exploration and science and that you know isms don't you know isms don't exist right when they do for like for story seed purposes you know you'll um you know especially when you're when you're looking at like the cardassians and uh and the yeah. um i the, mean you realize it's a, the smartness of it it's it's a, a surprisingly nice show you know what i'm saying like yeah. it's not trying to be too much of any one thing it, it it's just try to I mean, it's not like so deep in drama that you're like, oh my god, the intensity of it all. At the same time, though, it's not like you're watching um, something so banal that it doesn't grab you. You know, it has that right. nice. It's just you just enjoy the ride, and they do become, for lack of a better word, almost like or like old friends. You know, you you want to see what they're up to now. You want to see what they're doing. Um, and the in the sci-fi, like I said, the, the idea of the future, and you think to yourself. Jesus Christ, why haven't we got there yet? You know what I'm saying? Like, why aren't we at the point where we're exploring space and going to Mars and going to freaking Europa and then trying to lead, this, you know, why isn't this the dream to go right. out there and see what further is out there? Because I find that I think people are get, have, um, lost our wonder. Um, I think we have lost our um, desire to learn. And I think a sort of like Star Trek if you hit it just right for some audiences, may you know, gives that little spark of going like, yeah, but look at what the questions could be out there. You know, look at all the possibilities. Get out of your freaking house, go out there and see what's hanging around. And yeah, you know, and I, I, I think that I like that for society. I, I don't. I think we should not lose our wonder. I don't think we should lose our curiosity of space, right, and the world and the universe because it's got to be way more fascinating than we th even think it is. I mean. Space had must be so fuller, so more, so much more full of wonder and amazement than we even know now. You know, so let's go out and just fucking find find this stuff. Well, and so especially with the James Webb Telescope, there's like on daily we're seeing like new amazing images that it's able to take and it's able to see so much it, out there and just like, yeah, I mean, and. You know, there's the universe is huge. I think I heard this is like more like galaxies in the universe and like grains of sand on the beach. I mean, it 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 it's so vast, and there's no way in hell we are alone in the universe. And if we are alone in the universe, that's the most profound thing that would ever exist as well. I mean, like it's profound if we're not alone, and it's profound that if we are alone. But the odds of us being alone is virtually zero. There's got to be something out there. And yeah. the, what it could be blows my mind of the possibilities. I mean, think of how diverse this planet is. There's so many things on this planet that if you looked at it on its own, you go, that looks totally alien to anything else that's on the planet. Can you imagine what another planet must look like? It's got to be insane. So, do you, do, so, are, so are you a, 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 a proponent of the dark forest hypothesis. Have you heard that one? Um, are we talking about um, dark energy, dark matter? No. So basically, it's like, why haven't we found any? Oh, why haven't we found any aliens? Oh, the and, um, is that the Fermi par paradox? No, this one is the opposite of that. Where it's like it's the dark forest hypothesis poses that any spacefaring civilizations would view other intelligent life as a threat and would destroy okay. any life that makes itself known as a result the electromagnetic spectrum relatively quiet without evidence of intelligent alien life so oh, yeah. there are a ton of so th this is the hypothesis that there's a ton of them but if anybody can sense if anybody can find them then they're, they're probably advanced enough that they would go out and destroy them so intelligent alien life forms get to a get to a point where they protect themselves from other alien life forms where this is where like other scientists are like telling like us as earth like shut up i <laughs> don't like you know what? what are you guys doing <laughs> like <laughs> you know but uh, if anybody senses like our signals then that means they're they, they, they may say they've advanced enough to actually like come and if they can advance enough to come that means they probably want our resources <laughs> like don't <laughs> you know what though I'm, I'm of the mind of screw it you know what I'm saying it's, it's like 
there I, I i have heard that um philosophy before the um, i think i think they call it like the dark force of dark wood something like that philosophy but i also was argued this though is it not human arrogance to assume any other life would think like we do um while you would have to have some amount of survival of the fittest flight or flight kind of um instinct in order to be successful to be you know because you, you had to somehow rise out of the woods and become your own civilization so you obviously got some sense of um competition things of that nature but to think that they would think that we do is probably arrogance but you know what if that's how we're going to die is by finding an alien spaceship coming to our planet screw it i think that's the way to go <laughs> you know what i mean you might as well it's going to happen eventually anyway you might, you might as well just get, go out in glory so here's so this is if you look you can find this on snoops so this is actually on snoops it's a fact check so all of your viewers out there that want to check this out for kind of like what you're saying jeff the james webb space telescope spotted a non-natural object moving towards earth so this is a claim that's unfounded it's not saying that it's not true um, so in September 2024, the James Webb Space Telescope observed a large non-natural object about 10 light years away from Earth moving towards the planet. So according to the posts, the large object is 10 years light away from, 10 light years away from the Earth, which was moving towards the planet. This post can, claims that the object has to be some sort of alien mothership because the James Webb Space Telescope has observed the object change its trajectory in an unnatural manner. So I haven't, I haven't heard that yet. I've not heard that yet. Yeah. So yeah, you can find. So it's so basically it is. So the way it's moving, if it's moving at light speed, this object will be here in ten years. So. Well, no, 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 no. Uh... 10, 10 light years, though. That wouldn't be 10 years, would it? If it moves at the speed of light, it will be. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, are they saying it moves at the speed of light, though? Um, it says so, 10 light years away. It's not saying it's moving at light speed. No, but I mean, that, so they're, they, 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 they pointed out that there's been um, that no no comment from from nasa either s disavowing it or or like saying it's true um <laughs> so that's been, they you know say it's true or false. Screw it. come by and visit just you know i hope the leader that it comes to when it finally arrives isn't a jackass and we can be friends and <laughs> but um i say it's worth it it's worth finding out but um, at the same time, I, th I think I also read somewhere that NASA said they might have found an alien signal coming to Earth. A lot of question of, it feels like over the last 10 years, there's more and more thought that there's been alien interaction at some point. And because right. I think there was like, uh, supposedly there was a mess. Um, they think they found an alien signal from somewhere that they first said it was unknown, but it felt like it was a, a, not, a natural uh, signal. Then they said it was just background. Then they said, now they're, I'm hearing rumors that they're saying that it's actually turned out to be real after all i don't know it's, it's weird it, it, it's sort of like everything's coming to a, to a head and be cool if turns out it's something and wouldn't that be the coolest thing in the world to realize the universe is if that is right and there is this intelligent life it has come by and even wipes us out or my last thought would be hey cool <laughs> right so hey so 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 jeff so we're going to be here this time again next year to celebrate your fourth anniversary then. Hopefully so, unless either I die, the show dies, or the universe has a cataclysmic event. Yes. You made it. You know, you, any podcast that makes it past 10 episodes is is going. It doesn't go. So You never know. Yeah. Well, you've been All on right. yours for a while, and for Kurt's been on, is what, on year like 15. I know. Jeez. Yeah, Kurt's just like, yeah, rock star. He's just never slowing down yeah. yeah yeah i can't imagine i don't know we'll be in 12 more years but i kind of hope I, I can be like kurt and be like hey welcome to my 15th year as i you know it's my, i have no teeth left at that point i'm just, just like barely like half blind and I, you know barely coherent but i'm still gonna guess because they still remember my show and that'd be pretty fun yeah so do you want to do you want to do your outro since you know it better 
You would think I know it better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my outro. <clears throat> Thanks for listening to another episode of the Virgin Stars Podcast. Please like and subscribe. Return for the next episode when somebody shows up on my show to discuss something. I don't know idea what those are discussed. Until next voyage, travel on.